Okay, let's let's start over again. This is Rachel Bernstein. Sorry, November nineteenth, interviewing Sam Rodriguez. Sam, go ahead. My name is Sam Rodriguez. I, I was born in a city called Valladolid, Spain, the old Castile. And my parents were born there, and my family was there for years and years and years. Uh, we were not immigrants people. Uh, we had to leave Spain because of the Spanish Civil War. My father was one of the good guys. He was an anarchist. Okay. And that's it, more or less. Can you spell the name of the town? Valladolid. Let me write it for you. So you left in 1937 or so? I was born in 1937, in the middle of the Spanish Civil War. And we left Spain in 1939. I was two years old. And came to? Everywhere. Into everywhere. If I begin to tell you what many countries, I believe that before I was 10 years old, I was already in five different countries. But it's a very long story. That South America? First, we went to France, and then we went Mexico, Cuba, and then Venezuela, and then Colombia, we stayed there for a while. And from there I traveled by myself all over South America. It's three countries that I've never been in the Americas, and it's Bolivia, Paraguay, and the, and the Dominican Republic. That's not very many. <laughs> <laughs> it's destiny, I guess, because working for the machine union, I used to work for the airlines. And between the airlines and the machine union, I've been in four United States of the Union. The only state I've never been is Hawaii. You have a travel yeah. uh, gene. Mm -hmm. so, so you grew up traveling around with your parents who were continued to be politically engaged? No. After they left? I, 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 I miss something. My father was an anarchist. My, my mother was a fascist. Oh my goodness. Very religious person. She believed in law and order, the church, and the nobility and the government. And oh. they stayed together? My or, father or only was, during the Popular Front? Uh, my father, you see, I don't really come from the working class. Uh, my father was very progressive and all this. But my family were the, you know, we have lawyers and we have a doctors and they have a lot of teachers. I became a teacher in the city of New York. Okay. Uh, once in a while, like I said, a doctor. But mainly that was the profession. My mother was, my mother was a, a graduated nurse when women didn't know how to write or read. That's impressive. Yes. So you said you traveled around with your family and then you traveled around on your own when yeah. you were still a teen, maybe? Uh, how, how, at what ages? And you have to connect to my background. You know, my two brothers were older than me and they were in school age. So I was always helping my father. And it's very difficult for people to understand the difference between an immigrant and a refugee. An immigrant always lives with something. Doesn't matter how poor he is, mm -hmm. somebody give him a nickel or something. A grandmother come and give her a chain or whatever. Uh, a refugee uh, lives without nothing. Uh, my father was very well connected, so we were not really, we were bad, but not really that bad. Uh, and uh, I don't know. That's more or less. Okay. So you. So my children, my brothers. Uh 
Before in school age, and I was educated by my father. My father used to be a teacher. Uh, one of his greatest crimes that uh, he was teaching the unions how democracy works. When in Spain? And it, you know, well, democracy works anywhere. Right. Because we never have democracy before that. We have the First Republic, didn't last too long. But the people of Spain were very well. Even so, that was not a good education. In general, they, very, they were very educated in things, you know. After all, you know, 10,000 years of human civilization. So the workers were, and the, the only crime that my father was is that he was teaching democracy and how democracy works and how the workers will do their destiny and all these things that we say here. So you got a lot of your education from your father. From my father. I never went to elementary school. I never went to kindergarten. I went to, or, and, and this is when we were living in Colombia. Uh, when we get economically a little better, uh, I took a, a test examination uh -huh. for high school over there is six years of high school and I was raised in the fourth year of high school so I did only two years of high school. So you had two years of formula, formal, formal education? Well, was but I had more than formal education with my father. It was the last two and, years And not only school. that, but the test, when I took the test, uh -huh. well, I had a high mark without never being in a school. He was a good teacher. Oh, excellent. So what happened when you graduated? Uh, I started my own business. What kind? Which is something that you is are you familiar with the zipponis that the Italian made supported which left around things that they put in sugar? Sure. Yeah, yes. in Spain in Spain we call them churros. Oh I know what churros a are. Churro. Sure. So long skinny. I used that I start a churro thing and uh, and also I have uh, uh, the meat parts you know that you make. Empanadas, empanadas yes. right? And I was making like a billionaire. I was helping the liberation of the, the Colombian woman because I took uh, four women that were made in the street, in the houses, uh -huh. and this woman is, you need to, you, I mean, should be a book about this woman. Not anymore, they're beginning to lose it. But all in Latin America in general, Women from the countryside, poor women, uh, they became mates. Right. And they treat, they were abused money wise and sexually abused too. It was a terrible thing. And if they get pregnant, they, the lady of the house will throw them out of the house. Uh, uh, I'm talking about more than 50 years ago. I'm 76 now. And I took four of these women, and I said, well, you have an apartment. And they didn't know how to do it. So I rent an apartment. I, give, I, I bought all furniture. They get there, and, they, they, and I stole them, and they were helping me in, in the store, making the pass, making the dinner. I was dressing in but that's another story. That's true. Bourgeois. Okay. So and then did. one time I sold it. To another Spaniard, and I took the money. I didn't realize when you are 19, you don't, you, you don't realize, you know. I was a lot of money for a guy, and I resolved to travel. And that when I traveled, it's like, you know, I was a before the hippies, I was a hippie. Guys, the only difference, okay. the only difference is that I work because wherever I go, I go with a truck driver, I help him, you know lot in the truck, whatever, and then he was going my direction. And give you a ride. Yes, I spent a year and a half doing that. And then I get a visa to come to the United States in 1958. By yourself? By myself. Then my, I have, my brothers, they have been here already. Ah, okay. But then the whole family consolidated in the United States. Okay, so what was your first job in this country? My first job in this country was in a 
printing place. It used to be called a quitable paperback. And in, and in a couple of years, I became a photographic printer, which was a job that people have to wait to get that job. But somehow, I learned fast, and I have one of my first experience, not me, but the union and the boss, it was a big place, a huge place. The union and the boss really breaking the contract, I guess. Well, not really, well, not really the contract, I don't think so. In any event, I was a helper. You were a printer's helper, and were I you helped. a and, member and of the that union? Was, yes. Okay. And, and that was other people, Americans, uh, older than me, that were, they were also helpers, and they had more time than me. And somehow, a guy from the union, a tall, tall Irish guy, he likes me, and uh, the boss brother recognized, whatever, and they made me a printer. So I had to deal with the helpers, and explain to them, listen, you know, they offered me the job. What do you want me to do not to take it? And they were, they understood, and they were very uh, upset and angry with the union, not with me directly. Really? That's yeah, good. Yeah, that was very good. I always, since that day, I never worked for no place that was no union in Great Really? Never, never. And, uh, I recognize that the American working class, in my opinion, is the best working class in the face of the earth. And it's a mystery. Nobody says that. Nobody knows about that. It's one of the most bloody labor movements in the face of the earth. One of the most? Bloody. Bloody. People die. Everything that you have and I have, mm -hmm. somebody did it for us. You know, from the Irish to the, the Germans, the Jews in New York, yep. the Italians, the Puerto Ricans, and now the rest of the people. You know. It's a tremendous history. You know that. I do. Yeah. I believe that more people through the years that have been more than the United States that even the Bolshevik Revolution, hmm. a lot of people to the years. Yeah, that's, that's the, interesting. The, the, so the, when you first got your job as a printer and the union gave you a promotion, did they do that because they knew you were going to be a good organizer? I have nothing to do with the union. Ah. I was not inclined to get involved in the labor movement because my experience of my father and all this, we want to stay away from that. Because it was Because it was, it was very, uh, a very, my father never talked. He never, never, never talked about the Civil War. Really? We left Spain and that was it. Never mentioned it. Never say anything. Hmm. And my house was never discussed anything. Well, if you, if your mother and your father were on different sides, yeah, but they were they were on different sides. But they talk about everything. They were a good marriage, mm -hmm. considering the times. Mm -hmm. You know, my my mother was not Simone de Beauvoir. You see what I mean? Uh, but she was very strong, a very strong Castilian woman with a Jewish Sephardic Jewish roots. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. So did she teach you some of those traditions when you were growing up? Not so we don't even knew that we were Sephardic until we came to the Americas and begin to see things that we never... We always have a, a good meal on Fridays. Why? We don't know. We never, we never knew. Oh, and then you get to New York and you find... You, we begin to see things that... Uh, my, father knew, my father knew everything. My father was a genius. Huh. Very calm, cool and collective. 
I always want to be like him. I inherit the character of my mother. I'm like a flash. <laughs> <laughs> my father was the most... I want to tell you something that is funny. My wife loved my father. I think that she stayed with me because she was in love with my father. <laughs> and, my, and my wife, when usually they say that a man looked for a woman that reminded them of their mother, uh -huh. I look for a woman that reminded me of my father. <laughs> I think, I'm, I, I think I'm going to other places. That, that's funny. So you're working as a printer, yes. and you're not very interested in the union. No, not really. So my, how long do you stay there? My, uh, I stay until 1965, 64, and then I get a job in the airport with Northwest Airlines. And I started there a cargo handler. And I don't want to get involved with the union at all. And so you never were involved in the printers' union. You knew it never, existed, never. but you didn't have I, much to do with we, it. We have a strike, and I was in the picket line, mm -hmm. and I knew how to respect the picket line, and I was pushing for the strike and all this. I was never involved, except in the personal level, with the chief steward and the business rep, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. They always called me, you know, I was a young guy, they always talked to me, and they liked me. But other than that, I never get involved. I didn't want to be... And when I went with the airlines, it's the same thing. I didn't want to be involved with the union. My goal, my dream was to be a college professor. I have the idea of teaching Spanish literature and Roman languages. I speak Italian, I speak French, and Portuguese, and Spanish. Like my friend says, he speaks all these languages, but he only speaks English. <laughs> and that was my goal. But then I realized that what more politics in the academia than in the union. And I was born into the labor movement by accident, totally by accident. I didn't have the roots, I have the things, I have my sympathy for the workers that were coming from my father. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I want to do nothing. And then, one time I have a grievance. You have a grievance. This is yeah. you're working as a cargo uh, what, uh, yeah. handler uh, at... At Northwest Airlines. Northwest Airlines. Not with Airlines. Airlines. At which airport? Yeah, at that, yeah Kennedy. Okay. Northwest Airlines now is was taken by Delta. Uh, and I have a grievance. And I wrote the grievance and I give it to my chief steward. His name was Julius Broski. A nice guy, a nice guy, good union man. But he took my grievance. That happened all the time. He put it on his desk and he forget to submit the grievance within time limits. And instead of telling me, if he have tell me some, I forget who you agree with. Let's see if we can do some. No, he told me that I have no grievance. And I say, oh yes, I do. I say, I have this argument, but I know I can't read the contract. What well, was something insignificant. They did call me for overtime in my day off when I was supposed to be called. That was eight hours of overtime. No, not a big thing. But the fact that he was denying me, I didn't feel good. So I pursued. And that way you sometimes gain the bureaucracy of the union and the system, in which sometimes many workers get frustrated, uh -huh. and then they say the union is not good. So I went to the local lodge, my local lodge, 1894, and I make a complaint. And, of course, this guy was going to the local lodge for 20 years. They knew him. So they seemed like, I don't have nothing. So we were divided into locals and districts. 
So I came to contact with my district in Minnesota and in um, Minneapolis. Called on the phone and they said, yeah, Julius told me that, that but you don't have it. Yes, I do. Again, they got you to go to the conventions of the district, they knew him. They denied me, so. Uh, I get this guy, the guy so, so frustrated. Julius Broski, tall big guy, nice guy. I'm telling this you, is nice guy. Nice. He, yeah, he was the chief too. Yeah. Uh, that he says, if you don't like the way I'm doing things, it's going to be nominations in November and elections in December. If you don't like it, run for office. Don't bother me. Let's see how good you are. And I said, you bet you I'm going to run. Oh, I'm sorry. That's OK. We can. I'll be my. Hello. Hello, son. Listen. I. L listen. Listen, I call you back because I'm in an interview. OK? I, I call you back. OK, bye bye. With my son, uh. which is another story with my children. Anyway, uh, I run. Uh, surprise, surprise. Did you I, campaign? I, uh, Did you campaign? Nothing. I didn't campaign nothing. I told people, I'm running for chief steward. Yeah. And the election came, and I vote, I, I win, I mean, yeah, well, like 300 people. I get like 200 votes. <laughs> and I took it, and nobody believed I was going to take it seriously. At that time, you have to see the composition of the working class in the airport. That was no Hispanics. I was the only Hispanic. Was one or two blacks. Uh, was mainly the so called American. Polish Americans, Irish Americans, German Americans, really. And uh, I began to take it, and I didn't, know any, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. I went to Broski, to Julius, hey, Julius, I don't know what to do with you. He said, like, I help you. And then I get with the mechanics, and I get with the cargo people, and I begin to process grievances and all this. I used to run the, carry my attache case. My fellow worker used to call me Puerto Rican Perry Mason. <laughs> That's a good nickname. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that was history. I I was I worked for the airline for 17 years, I think, and I was fired 15 times mm -hmm. in 17 years for union activities. That's impressive. And then, what what kinds of things were you fired for? Insubordination, doing this or that, coursing a uh, manager. I mean, uh, they accused me of conducting a, a white car strike. The union was in my back too. And unfortunately, I have nothing to do with it. I was not. I was on vacation with my fellow workers. Result to strike. But what happened is that I. Oh, one thing that I almost forget. The American working class, how good is it? They recognize when somebody's serious and sincere. And with all the baloney that they give me because I was Hispanic and I have a knack and uh, they recognize my efforts. So they used to collect my salary every week when I was fired and give it to me. Every week they give the equivalent to my salary, which was a tremendous help. And then I became an officer of my local, in the local. And I became an organizer with the local. And I organized 2,000 people. Belonged to a company called Marriott Corporation, from the Marriott Health. OK. And everything I do, probably from my father, I followed through. I follow, you know. So I read everything about Mr. Marriott. I found out that they were Mormons. I know where they come from. I know how they started with the hot chops in Washington, D.C. 
selling hot dogs and root beer. Mm. And now they are multimillionaires and they hate the unions. And they give. Now, what, what gave you, how did you target them initially? Well, like any other thing, the, some workers came and, uh, and they said that they, that they need a union. They came to your They local came lodge. to my local. Okay. Yeah, and they talked to a friend of mine that became a, a commissioner, commissioner of labor in Nassau County. Oh. A good Irish guy. In the airport, I was with the Irish. And most of the people were Irish. When I became an officer of the Machine Union, I, well, everybody was Italian. But anyway, I organized that, and to me it was like, this is what you're supposed to do. I didn't realize that very few people organized 2,000 people. So these were 2,000 workers who did what? They, they do the, Mario, they do the in-flight services. They used to put the food in the plane. Oh, I see, okay. And they work in the kitchens and all that. They have between La Guardia and Kennedy, they have four small restaurants, like the one they have here, you know? Mm -hmm. And they have uh, seven or eight uh, kitchens where they prepare the food. And they have throw drivers that deliver the, the food to the airplane. Well, very complicated and very demanding, 24 hours a day. And, uh, oh, before the union, uh, made me a grand old chef. I became a business rep for Marriott. I was doing the, the negotiations and all the, and that was another story. Okay. Uh, I was the only guy that was fired by the union. The machine union fired. It's funny. Keep going. I'm just going to One check. of my Irish friends, his name is Tim Connolly. He's retired. He was for transportation. He was in charge of, uh, of the things in, in the East Coast, by the way. Very intelligent guy. The kind of guy that if it's a catastrophe and it's only two people left, I was wishing if I'm left, I would like to have Tim Connolly because he can do things. Very intelligent, an Irishman is streetwise from Hell's Kitchen. I don't know, I don't know how much education he have, but very smart. You can talk with him about anything, and he have knowledge. Very different to many other kind of chefs. And I was doing negotiations, and he signed the first contract. And then I began to the negotiation. The company immediately started a petition to decertify the union. I was serving over 2,000 people with grievances, problems, and the, the petition to decertify people that were fired. I have arbitration. And when we were negotiating the second contract, Tim Connolly came, they sent him to assist me. And he came and he, at one point in time, he says, are you, I, I leave you alone all this time, but now uh, I'm going to intervene in the negotiations because after all, this is my territory. Because I figured out that the international sent him to do that. And I said, wonderful thing. But I tell you one thing. It's other things I cannot tell you. Because it's always corruption. Uh, something happened there somewhere. But anyway, uh, when, uh, when he said that to me, I said, I tell you what, thing, I have work through my neck. You can't take my negotiations. You can't negotiate the contract, but you are going to sign that contract. 
not me. I'm not going to sign a contract that you're not going to negotiate because you already negotiated the first contract and I inherit all this from those negotiations. So he was a little bully, you know? Uh, don't forget, you know, the Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. So he says to me, give me your credentials. And I believe that he had, immediately I believe that he had the authority from the international. So I said, of course. He was used to intimidate people and people back off. I said, okay, I gave to my wallet and give him my credentials. And when I gave him the credentials, I put on the table in front of all the negotiating committee. Uh, all the people from the negotiating committee were, and then he says, so you are quitting, huh? And that when I realized they have no authority. Ah. And I said, no, I'm not quitting. You just fired me, you stupid Irish, bada bim, bada bum, bada bum, and I went to hit him. And the guy grabbed me, and I was trying to kick him, and they grabbed me. <laughs> what, what, it's funny today, but not funny that day. So anyway, I left. Goodness. And I well, went, wait, anyway, you left. How, what happened? They I left. I left the room because I was fired. And they kept negotiating? No, I went back to the airlines. I went back to the airlines, and uh, because, you know, I have a leave of absence on the airlines. I went back to the airlines, and then the the vice president, the name was Peter Paul, oh, vice the, president of transportation from the union, okay. one of the divisions of the union. Right. He called me, and he says, "What's the matter with you, son?" I said, "What's the matter with me? That stupid Irish barabim barabam barabun fire me." He said, "He have no authority to fire." I say, "I know that now. I didn't know it then." And he said, I want, go back, go back to your job, I need you badly. And I said, he said, John, I'm already back with the airline. And he said, holy kid, you are faster than Spirit Gonzalez, why you didn't call me? Anyway, he said, okay, now the union always were afraid that I may sue because I was an elected officer. So they put in, in the record a voluntary leaving the job. Uh, That's how it appears in the record. That I was a business rep. I voluntarily I left the job. And then I then to, they called me and offered me yeah, I work with the airline and all this. They called me and they offered me a job as a, a Grand Rose rep. And the guy who called me, a fellow named Danny Patalano, I said, who are you? I'm a grand old friend, I'm gonna have an interview with you. He said, about what? You know, I was very, and I met with him. And uh, he said, yes. They were looking for an Spanish speaking person. Uh -huh. When well, Spanish is last name. I realized that immediately. I went to my wife, I'm looking for a token, and she said, try it, if they don't give it. My wife said, you are dedicated, you believe in this, you came to this, if you don't like it, you go back to our line, try it. And I said, okay. Well, I had an interview with Danny, they had an interview with the guy that was the administrative assistant, and all the time I said to him, but they're not going to hire me. And they had an interview with the vice president, that was uh, Sala Iacchio, very easy going Italian fellow from Brooklyn, from the Navy Yard. Okay. A veteran of the Second World War. Uh -huh. And wimpy singer. And I was in their office and Sal was very cautious. And he said, Sam, we hear a lot of good things about you. He said, but I want to be very honest, we hear a lot of bad things about you. <laughs> and I said, of course, you know. They had a lot of political enemies, and I got this and that. And we were going around that. And then Wimpy says, laughing, he says, can I curse? Oh no, or I cannot yes, curse. Yes, you can. <laughs> Wimpy says, Sam, we hear that you're a fucking communist. 
And I said, that pissed me off because I'm not a communist. I'm a fucking anarchist. <laughs> so we we started laughing and started went like this and uh, back to my wife said, dude, hey, what happened? She said, why are you telling me? I said, why could they ask me? And they pissed me off, you know. They, they're not going to call me. And they called me. They called me and became a grand representative organizing. And I did that for uh, since 1980 to 97 when I retired. That's, I retired at 62. That's a long because stretch. Because I was, I was beginning to, I fight with everybody. All these guys, all oh, sons, is a good organizer, he's a pen in the yard. I organize, and the only reason they didn't fire me is because I, I cannot knock it. I knock in the doors. I bring, I bring the bacon home. I organize. One by one. More than one by one. See, and I continue to do that. And I'm retired, I'm still organizing. Tell me more about your on-the-job before you retired. You did a lot of organizing. That was all. I was, they called me every time they have a lead. Uh, Sometimes they call me uh, when they have foreigners. How much of the organizing did you do using your languages other than English, do you think? Small. For what they hire me, I organize more English speaking people than minorities. Uh, I, ha oh, I have a story there. And I was always in trouble. One time uh, they used to send me in the, in the winter I was working north and in the summer I was working south. I was assigned to organize the uh, technicians that made the, most, the missiles for the Trident, the Trident submarine oh, in okay. King Bay, Georgia. And it was terrible because that lead was not created by me. I have nothing to do with the lead. Some other Grand Lodge rep received the lead. Right and they give it to me, which you should say, no, no. The guy was new, and they sent me. So they sent me to Kings Bay, Georgia, near the Okefenokee Swamp. Okay. I hate nature. <laughs> Not to mention this is Georgia in the summertime? In the summertime. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was in Cumberland Island and all that, you know, thing. Uh, what's funny when when I say about the American working class anyway, I have a committee of about 25 people, mostly people that came from the Air Force, the Navy, the military, that have the skills. They would not only have college degrees, but they also have some, some technicians here, you know? Unbelievable, the things that they have, you know, the resistance to metal, the resistance of this, uh, how much uh, fire something will catch. They were making it. So one time I was having a meeting and they were talking among themselves. And I said, my God, I've been having problems understanding these guys with that broken accent, you know, I mean, the, the southern accent. And I said, my God, if I have problem understanding them, they must have a big problem understanding me. <laughs> so I said, many too many times, I said, guys, if you don't understand what I said, please tell me, because I know what I'm doing. And I don't want you to lose this election. I don't want anybody to get fired. If you follow what I'm telling you, we will win, and nobody will get fired. So finally, a kid named uh, Roger Sutton. He was a local guy from that area. He said, Sam, we have no problem with your accent. You are the only guy from the north with a decent accent. 
but you have to read in the line. The really what he was saying is, you have an accent, but you're not a Yankee. Right. That's exactly what. <laughs> and um, the reason I said that is because okay. there were people totally different than me in the way they think military, uh, military, the way they think, the way they act. They have nothing in common with me. Mm -hmm. One thing, very important thing they have at that point, working class. They didn't even know that themselves. But that's what I was just going to ask. You talk about the American working class, but if you ask Americans they who don't. economically fit in that, they don't call themselves no, working they don't. class. No. So how do you get off calling them? Do you use that term? In front of them? Yeah. No. We cannot use working class. Uh -huh. oh. We have got a problem with one guy because at the time, Weeping Singer endorsed Jesse Jackson for president. And I was asking questions. I said, I don't know what they do, you know. The important we are going to organize this place and we are going to give you a good contract. And I took it away from the politics. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. That must have been hard in the South. Oh, yeah. But I never had problems organizing the South. Never. You know, it, uh, I went to other campaigns that were not my campaigns. Oh, yes, I went in another campaign in Florida. We went to Alabama and Mississippi. There were campaigns of somebody else, and I came to help. And I was doing campaigns in Chicago, a couple of campaigns in Chicago. And it's, to tell you the truth, sometimes when I look at my records, these places that we organize, I totally forget. But it's How in, many places would you go in a year? Give me an idea. All depends, you know. Mm -hmm. Four or five places. Don't forget that when you have a serious campaign, sometimes you go to a campaign and it's not there. And you can't tell it's not there. Mm. When people go and uh, insult you or they don't open the door or something like this, you know. But the story I, I told you, I have a hundred stories like that. And I always... About connecting with people, people that you have very I, little I, in common. Uh, I came to the conclusion that when people talk about the rednecks, I always immediately realize that you have the rednecks from the south, but you have the rednecks from the north. And you go and try and in that border between New York and Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Well, Wellsville, New York, right by the Pennsylvania border. That was, that was the south. <laughs> that was the south. And I discovered something. I have nothing to do, I have to do with the union. One time I was driving looking for, because I get familiar with the whole area. The first two days, I find everything about the town. The people, what they do, what they make an industry, what they go and drink, who is the boss. Do the Can boss you have do a, this by do yourself the, do, or with a oh local no, by myself. Do the boss have a mistress? Do, do this. And this is before all this, I don't know how they organize now with all this high technology, because I saw people today that they are all the time in the telephone or the computer. Right. What happened with the one-to-one, -one, face to face organizing? My whole my whole index was my appointment book. You know. I have my appointment book, then I bought a big one to write things and dates and meetings and all the uh, but I don't know how they do it. With the technology instead the of the technology. Face -face. So you were saying you go to a place, you drive around and find out everything. I find out How everything. How do you find it out? Just by going to bars and listening you, to people? I think that you, after a while, you develop certain things. And you develop also certain psychology. Uh, when people say, yeah, 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 uh, they are with you, and they are not with you. You know, it's a lot of things that you find out. And, uh, you have to be very careful because sometimes people, uh, 
one time I was calling my wife. I don't even want to tell them, my friends that are in the union from those states. One time I was in Mississippi and I went to a house, to a house call. And I gave flashback. I cannot believe that I was in the United States. I get the feeling that I was in Honduras. Really? What's no difference? Mm -hmm. But these people, they don't know that. They are Americans. Right. We are the best country in the world. And this, that may be true. But they are not living the best life in the world. A lot of millionaires in Nicaragua that live like kings. Yeah. But that was very, the, the, the was um, mud floor. Uh, I called my wife and said, honey, if that were not because these people could speak in English, I believe I was in Guatemala, yeah. in one of the Indian villages. When, how, when did you get married? <laughs> you are getting now a difficult. Well, I feel like being an I organizer met, and having a family I met my wife. <laughs> I went, when I went, uh, I came to the United States and I didn't like it. I went back to Europe. And I was a tourist guy in Mallorca. You came to the United States and went back to Europe for a right. while before right. you came yeah. here? When I went back to Europe, it was really, I didn't know Europe. Because it was yeah. post-war. So I became a tourist guy in Mallorca for a year. And uh, then I escaped with a Swedish woman to Sweden, Estocolm. Because I was coming here and she said, Oh, I'm going to the United States, I'm going to Sweden. And what a difference. Because when I went to Sweden to work for three months or so, uh, before they give me the visa to go out, an immigrant worker, whatever, they give me my social security, they give me my, what was going to be my pension, my medical plan, all these things. It's but I didn't, huh? I didn't really work in Sweden. I, I, it's, it's not, I don't even want to mention that. So I was engaged with a girl from Mallorca, and I have a house in Mallorca, and I sold the house in Mallorca. And then I said, I will never submit myself to any more of these things. My whole goal was to look for a rich, old French woman and get married. Well, I met one. <laughs> and she introduced me to my wife. And my wife was in the streets of Paris all the time. IBM, Honeywell, profiteer of the guerra, you know, marching out. And I told her, because I'm six years older than her, I told her, don't do that, don't be stupid, don't be involved in this. Politics is terrible, look what happened to me. Okay. But she was my father, so I married her. <laughs> <laughs> but that was not that easy. I want to marry her, but she don't want to marry me. So we went, and uh, we had my daughter, before you got married? Before we got married. Uh, too many little things in between. And then we ended that uh, they were going to throw me out from France, but they cannot, she was a French citizen. Uh, so I left, and she never told me she was pregnant. I never. I then a friend of mine told me, or your daughter. I said, what? So I called her and we get together and they said, what do you do this to me? And she said, I don't want to obligate you to anything. And finally she came to the United States. According with her eyes, the United States was the enemy. And um, we spent almost two years until I said, honey, we have to get married or they will deport you. And we will be in the same situ situation as before. And we already waiting. For, she was pregnant, waiting for my twins. I had twin boys. Oh. And then she said, you're right. 
how we get married. So she didn't want to get married because she was... Could she have won anything to be obligated to have a piece of paper? She said, we love each other. We are together. She was very advanced. You should be interviewing my wife. I, I agree with her on that <laughs> subject. <laughs> uh, she is a fantastic woman. A fantastic woman. So you got married before you really became an organizer. I, I was already, when we get married, I was beginning to get into the union. Mm -hmm. But my goal still was to be a college professor. Then I had to switch my aspiration because I was a parent. So I went to uh, uh, get licenses to teach. I have a license to teach Spanish in, in the city of New York. Spanish junior high, Spanish high school, social, by, social studies bilingual, junior high and high school, and Italian. Also, that was, that was my my license. But I never pursued it. You I, never used. No, I I was a, I was a, I was a substitute teacher all the time. Yeah. I did I did substitute teaching for almost ten years. When I was working with the airlines. And you did both at the right. same time. You taught on the side. I, I, no, I, I used to, I used to work the midnight shift. I would start like 10, 30, 11 o'clock, go home, take a shower, uh, have breakfast, and then I got rotation, and then I come back home and sleep, and then I went back to the airline. A routine, huh? routine. And you did that while you had a family? Yes. Yes. How did you ever have time for the family? That's a lot. Oh, yeah, I work with the family there. That's a lot of family. Yeah. That's a lot uh, of time. Well, it's, you know, when you, when you have what you have. Oh, jeez. And did your wife stay home with the kids while you, yes. that you did that? She so took that, that, she took that option, totally conscious that she wanted to be a yes. housewife. She said to me one time, I know you and you will always bring bread to this table. I know you will always have some. I don't have to worry about you that things are not going to be done. Uh, but I would like to stay home. And that was it. There's one more irony. What's that? I give you all this background, right? Yeah. My twin boys, uh, they have master's degree. My daughter is a nurse. My twin boys became policemen in the city of New York. <laughs> from an anarchist father, I'm from, I'm from a union father, from an anarchist grandfather, a union father, and my, tons are, my two sons are policemen. And we disagree all the time and everything. And my... Wait, are they Republicans? No, they are not Republican, but they are policemen. You know what I tell them? I tell them, listen, the reason why they pay you such a good salary and benefits and pensions is because you are the means of repression of the ruling class or the working class. That's what you do, that's your job. Don't believe that you're catching thieves. I say, you were catching thieves, you will be arresting Rockefeller's son, and that will never happen. So we always talk about, but they say, yeah, yeah, we say this, they're okay, but uh, the first one, Joey, became a, 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 that's very sad because he had a master. He was accepted in, uh, in St. John's University, Columbia, and NYU for law school. Huh? My daughter-in-law, which is one year younger, took the test to, and my son had higher mark than her. She's a lawyer today, and my son is a, a my son is a, a sergeant of detectives. Uh, he became a hero in the towers. Uh. The machinist union. He was a machinist because he worked in the airport for a while. Um, the machinist union gave honors to him in one of the conventions. Uh, you know, Father George. The priest that was the chapman for the fire department? Yes. 
the first the first person that died, mm -hmm. he died in my son's arms. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh. And he had very sad stories about that. And then the other one was not a policeman. Uh, when the towers he went to help, he was a worker. He went to help and then he said, I want to serve my country. And that's when he decided that he that wanted to When he told me he was going to serve the country, he said, Go to uh, go to Afghanistan and get a good a good a good life insurance on my name. Yeah, I'm not really He's a detective. Uh, Joe is a, a sergeant of detectives in uh, the same prison he started. China, uh, literally, literally, literally in Chinatown. Okay. That's why he responded immediately he was at, the, at the tower. He, he was the one that called us to tell to the plane he the tower. Mm -hmm. He didn't know at the time how, and then we didn't hear from him for 18 hours. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, oh, I, you know. So, you know, me being, me being a Jewish mother, I was hoping to save my, my son the detective, my son the professor, and my daughter the, the nurse. <laughs> now the only one I my, the only one is my daughter the nurse. <laughs> the other one are cops. Tell me a little more about being a Grand Lodge rep. Oh. You, you organized everywhere. And Where, we were you involved in headquarters? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Do you follow what I come from all this? Uh, I'm not too much for yes sir, no sir, you know. Well, you said I, that they I, wanted to fire you over yeah. and over again, so I need to hear <laughs> a little bit more question? about that. I always question the policy. Why did they need to I fire always you? do things. I always disagree with them. Uh, I have good friends, Tom Bovenbarger. Tom Boven, I know Tom Bovenbarger when he used to have hair. <laughs> he was a kid. Uh, I have the 10 year seniority on him when he became a special rep. He was a very timid guy. Huh. Uh, and we were friends, good friends, until he became my boss. That was the end of the friendship. Now I'm retired and we're friends again. Got it. You're not uh, easy to have as yeah. a, uh, to supervise, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's, you cannot challenge. Uh, you have to rely, probably you know this, that the Machine Union was found by Mason. Mm -hmm. I'm a Mason. Uh, when did you become a Mason? In 1980. 1980. Yeah. So yeah. you were in the Union before yeah. you were a Mason. Yeah. yeah. I became a Mason in Manhattan. Uh, mm -hmm. My lodge is the same lodge of many very important people. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a mason in my lodge. Teddy Roosevelt was in my lodge. Uh, Fiorello La Guardia was a mason in my lodge. Uh, by the way, Fiorello La Guardia is a Sephardi Jew. You know that, huh? I actually did not know that. Yeah, he, he was Jewish. Italian Jew. Yeah, and uh, so you have to, the reason I'm telling you I'm amazing is because I understood the Machine Union immediately. All the whole, all the structure of the Machine Union is Masonic. Right. The first person that was no Mason, I believe, was Whippensinger. Uh -huh. And then none of the other, Corpus or Tom are Mason. But before that, I believe everybody was amazing. And when I came with the guard, Lot of number of that were Masons. And we inherited that from the Masonic lodges. We have district and we have Grand Lodge reps from the Grand Lodge. Right. The Grand Lodge used to be called, the president of the Machine Union used to be called uh, Grand Master Machines. Right. Or something similar. Okay. That, yeah. So that was the structure. Now, the idea that the Union how Grand Lodge reps is the, the Grand Lodge, the Grand Lodge reps were going to be the cushion between the international 
and the membership. Mm -hmm. the, we are always representing the international president. That's why when Tim Connelly came and fired me, I believe that he had authority, but he didn't have authority. Right. And that's what the only difference. But that is structure of the machine union. So when I came in, was like, I don't know, the, the job, the mechanics of the machine, so-called the, the union machine, mm -hmm. was working. But that, in the human aspect, was the spirit wasn't was terrible. strong. Everybody drink, everybody woman, everybody guys had three or four divorces, you know. That was not that was not Masonic at all. But that was the structure. But then that broke just about five years before I came board. And was that in my case and many other people when you begin to work for the machine union, what you become? An employee of the machine union. So finally, some of these grand lords reps resolved to create a union to represent them. And they create an association. Okay. And then other people within the union became association. But the machine union for that the National Labor Relations Board had then guilty contempt of, uh, of labor, you know, charges. They filed charges against the machine union for trying to break our union. So when I came, I already have a union in the union. Okay. And they hate it. And the union, the, the union, the union, we never been very strong because the membership is never very strong. My great dream was that the Grand Lord strike but the union. But you maintained close relations with Rupert Singer. Yeah. In spite of the fact that you were yes. agitating yes. on behalf of the organization. Yes, because he, he knew I was a union guy. And we, we always have... Uh, when, when I first started working, my godfather was Salayakio and Wimpy. So I was in paradise. What a job. You know, yeah. I used to drive with them. I used to drive them in New York. Uh, I used to go for dinner with him, lunch with them, uh, and then I get laid off. Yeah, was a layoff at the machine union. And when I came back, not from, for causing trouble, but because uh, of, not for no, causing no, no, trouble, no. just because of the because downsides. Because right. Layoff. Yeah, okay. and uh, and when I came back, my godfather Salayak was dead, and. And then they begin to say, oh, wait a second. I came back and before I was, you know, one of the boys, and I came back and I was an outsider. Bing, bing, you know. So I said, oh, wait a second. So I begin to realize all these things that were doing it. But I always have a relation with Wimpy. And I had the opportunity, more than many other people, I said the people in headquarters and the secretary, you know. That every time he comes to New York, to, at one time I drove him from New York to Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, he was going to uh, to talk to the people of Prad Whitney. At the time, Prad Whitney in, in East Hartford. Ah. And they made the, the engines mm -hmm. yeah. for the Boeing. Right. And we were talking about politics and all this. And uh, he asked me what the people said. And I said, I said they beat some people said you are a communist. Like he, he got very upset with that. Uh, in the way back when he spoke there, he said that the Reagan administration believed that anybody that worked in America and was a worker like us, that we were all looping proletarians. So on the way back, I said, <laughs> "It would be so." The Reagan administration believed that we were looping proletarians. Turn around and look at me. He said, "You know, I bet you were the only son of a bitch there that know what looping proletarian is." <laughs> <laughs> so that's the relationship I got with him, you know. 
Then there was a lot of reports. They were giving a lot of reports about me. Uh, he. A lot of reports about you. My jealousies and you know. Uh, and the, I had the tendency talking uh, working class languages. I don't eat poo you see what I mean? <laughs> so they was complaining about things, never about Wimpy. And I very seldom talk anything about the guys in power because I tell them their faces. It's a better way to do it. Oh, I have a lot of problem with Charlie, with this Charlie. Because <laughs> I say, he's a teacher. He was a teacher for years. And I say, Charlie, you cannot be a director and a teacher, especially for retired. We are not getting paid. You see, you have to be a director. Mm -hmm. You have to direct people. But he has that school. He, he always been a teacher. Yep, absolutely. He never been a, you know, of course when he was 15 years old or whatever, he was working somewhere. But he never been a really, you know, he never had a, a boss on top of his view. But that's what happened with with people, but in general, uh, and so you people reported you, but you kept on organizing. And I, so kept, I kept doing what I have to do, organize. And I was never, never really. I liked the job. I was happy with the job and all that. But I was never worry about. Uh, one time I had a big dispute with Tom Bob and Barrett. Okay. And a fellow that he never organized anybody in his life uh, got it with in Pittsburgh. And I was in big trouble with a vice president from the Eastern Territory, George Pollitt. And he came, he called headquarters and he said, I he don't want me in New York anymore. And uh, they deported me to Cleveland. And I spent almost two years in Cleveland. Did you move your family there? Huh? Did you no, move? no, no, no. I, you see, by the contact that we have, the maximum that they give you away from your house is two weeks. So what I did is, every two weeks I go home. But in the week that I was not going home, my family will come to Cleveland to visit me. Yeah, we have a, I, I, practi I practically lease a, nice room in the Holiday Inn in Cleveland and what room for my children, my wife to come and visit me. Uh -huh. So the family link, you know. So they would and, come for the weekends? Yeah. And the people from uh, from Cleveland, I discovered that I developed better friends in Cleveland that I have my Italian friends in New York what they used to take me for dinner every day. Right. And, you know, Sammy, oh my, I love you, Sammy, and Fratel, and all this, and then a lot of things happen. So it's, uh, but with Tom in Pittsburgh, he called me to tell me that I was going back to New York. That, by the way, I didn't really want to go back to New York. I was telling them that I want to go back to New York, that I was not happy in Cleveland. Because if I have tell them that I was happy in Cleveland, they will send me to New York. <laughs> so anyway, the time came that they sent me to New York. And he was really giving me a beating. Huh. Tom Bokenbach. And I said, Tom, the greatest aspiration of humankind is not to be a grand old rep. That's not the greatest aspiration. And I said, as a matter of fact, I don't think it's of a great aspiration or a priority in the world to be president of the Machine Union. It's other things in life. I said, uh, everything can come to an end. Now, he said, you come back to New York. I left it when I was furious. I was driving back to Cleveland to get my underwear. And in the road, I get so furious 
You see, I have delayed. Sometimes I don't explode like that, but the more time that goes, I get angrier and angrier. So I was driving, going by to Cleveland from people, in one of those tours of the police where you're not supposed to make the turn. Uh -huh. I turned around and I was going to go back to open back. I was really going to smash it. But I have no gas. So I passed, stopped in a gas station. That was before the portable phones and all. Right. They were really, they were just coming. The car phones that were like this big. Right, they were funny. And you have Giant. to have a big thing in the right. part of the car. So I stopped in the gas station and I said, let me call my consigliere, my wife. And I called and I told her. And she said, but are you coming back to New York? I said, yeah, but this guy, you know, I believe he was my friend and look what he's doing. It. And he said, she says, listen, go and get your things from Cleveland, come back to New York, and when you are here, we talk about, and if the things get bad, you know, you tell him what you want to tell him. Relax, relax, take it easy. And I say, oh, you always, I say, how come you are so smart? I, okay, I'm going to do what you tell And I went back to Cleveland, and then I went back to New York. And that relation continued to be, you know. Tense. Yeah, tense. And then it was 97. I was 62. And I was not getting happy with these things, you know, so I, I retired. When I told Tom Wolfenbacher I retired, he had a smile from ear to ear. <laughs> I was, <laughs> how happy he was. You were a thorn in his side. That's <laughs> yes, right. Very proud. So that was uh, in '97. I retired. And, uh, Tell me a little bit about what 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 were you doing that made? Then I was planning to go back teaching. I have a million things to do. Uh -huh. A million things. To no, do. but what were you doing that caused the, t the caused the friction? The first of all. They they started with a program in organized. With what kind of organization? A program. Oh, program. In organized. Okay. That used to be called, a guy, uh, Roger Nayala is here. He was one of the initiators. He was an AA. And when and, and, uh, Tom Boffenbauer was my coordinator. And a grand old rep from Florida, Kinakis, Tony Kinakis from the airline. They were my coordinators. And uh, the program was organizing by the book. And I said, this never works. And everybody was new in the new organizing department. Nobody wanted to raise their voice, nobody wanted to say anything. And uh, why you say that? And why you're so negative? I say, I'm not negative. Organizing by the book. They say, you have to organize it whatever you can. You have to organize from the top, in the bottom, or on the bottom. This organize. I, I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book. How to organize, not by the book. <laughs> and I remember very clearly, because then it happened again. Tom and um, Tom Oppenbagel and Kinakis, uh, we were the two of us talking. And they were going to be my coordinators. And I still said to them, He's some shit. I have the two of you as coordinators, coordinators of me and other people, and you never organize a human being in your life, which is true. They never organize anyone. Well, ten years later, we were the three ones together again, and something happened, and I remind them, and Tom Bockenbacher was laughing, and he was like saying to me, you right? Tony Kinaki, the a kind of rep, he was furious that I said that. <laughs> he never organized. And this is one of the things that happened, that we get people in leadership that never organize. Who might have other good You're qualities right. but don't have that. You're right. I, well, after we organized United, mm -hmm. that were like 30,000 people, and they assigned a whole bunch of people to La Guardia, La Guardia, Newark, and Kennedy. And what people on top of people. And I tell her, listen, 
and no more cars coming from here. In New York City, La Guardia, and Uber, it's a hundred percent there. Want to go? You have all these people. Eh? We are doing nothing. I said, but we have a whole bunch of little stations all over New England, yeah. Hartford, Connecticut, the airport in Westchester County, uh, Albany, uh, Plattsburgh, uh, uh, Buffalo, and then uh, in in um, in Maine. Burlington, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Vermont, and I said, Let, I'm going to try that. I said, oh, hey, Sam. I said, you're right, you're right, you do whatever you want. So I said to my wife, let's go for a mini vacation. The kids will grow up and all that. So we, we went with my wife, and when I, what I discovered is that 20 people here, 10 people here, 80 people here, at the end of the day, we had more people than the people who work in La Guardia or in Canada. And nobody ever visited them. Nobody was there. So it's like I was seeing El Dorado. Right. Everybody was signing cards and I was talking with them. Yeah. And um, we had a great party in Reno when we win the election. In? Reno, Nevada. Ah, okay. He was celebrating it. Right. Um, and, uh, and then I want to help in a campaign with Northwest Airlines, uh, but the guy that was the assistant to Tom, the vice president, the resident vice president was Bob Taylor, and we were great enemies. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he said, no, you cannot go there. I said, why? They say, I'm the only guy that understand, because I'm one of the few people that know how to organize in the different laws of labor in the United States. You see, you have only for the ruling class is something for the purpose of dividing it. We are the only country that have the National Labor Relations Board, the Regular Labor Act, the Farmers uh, Law, uh, guards and security, if five or six tough hearty, you know, the mm -hmm. different thing that I'm, I'm one of the few persons that I know how to organize in all these fields. So I want to be because I came from the airlines and he didn't let me. So at that time I organized a play, dog house in Tampa and I organized a company that was a service company, now one of the biggest groups in the machine union, Hudson General, but they changed the name. Mm. And I organized them in, in, uh, in Miami, and in, uh, what the other city that is in the coast? Fort. Uh, so, where did you? Yeah. Uh, and with that, I didn't go to the campaign I want to go, and I was 62, and when I retired. Now, before we move on to the retirement, one other question. How did you manage to keep your happy in your family and good at your job when you were on the road so much? Uh, you have already keep telling us about be, how you call in your wife be, all the because, time. Because I'm a sweetheart. Yeah, I see. It's simple. I don't know. That. Maybe my personality, maybe because... Uh, from my family, we have a very strong family values, you know. Uh, nobody ever in my family, for generations and generations, they were divorced, so they never have it. Uh, my family will never have children uh, out of being with one woman or married, you know. It, because even so, we were not married with my wife. We were married. You were together. together. So it's a, uh, and uh, especially I think the another reason is that my wife is a strong woman. She's not a push around. I will never be able to marry a weak woman. Never. I will get bored with a weak. 
I will get disgusted with it. She's a very strong woman, but she's the opposite of me. She's my father. She's calm, cool, and collective. She's that the way she is. So that, you know, that is. So that she, is that. You both figured out how to deal with you being gone all the time and still staying close. Yes. I got, I got a few things to. When I was getting the job that we we're going to travel, I said to my wife, well, the job is going to be like a traveling. If I come home and I find a pair of boots in my closet, they better fit me. So she says, that's fair. But let me tell you something, she says. If you come home from one of your long trips and you are too tired, we are in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to prove myself when I get home, even if I have a headache. <laughs> She always said to me all the time, do whatever you want to do, but do it right. Like for instance, when I was going back to Pittsburgh, that was a great advice. A uh, couple of times, even here in the organizing, one time with Maria Cordone, we're ready to leave. That Maria Cordone really, I always use the expression of the Godfather. When I retire, I have a great reputation in New York. So a lot of independent unions that were calling me to help them. In the machine union, uh, we take we take about the poverty. The workers. Okay. The workers. Okay. And it's corruption, people do things, but really it's, it's a, a, about the poverty. So I get I get offers from independent union. So I went to work with a couple of independent unions and they were paying me cash on the side. And I was doing this for one year. I told Wolfenbach, I told everybody, I'm retired now and now I want to make money. <laughs> because you never let me make money. And uh, I remember Don Wharton, he retired, he was the the money man, the, mm -hmm. uh, and I say, well, you, no, uh, you work and work for another union, and we can cut your pension. You know, we could do membership. I said, I said, let me tell you what. When I retired, and you call my pension to remember what you have, Schwartz and Schwartz talking to you from New York. I just start laughing, but, but you see. For anybody that is weak, they can intimidate you. Mm -hmm. All these years, and they were going to cut my pension. Believe me, I'm serious. Schwartz and Schwartz will be there. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <coughs> so anyway, we're doing that. So you retired and you retired. I was happy. I was happy. For other yeah. and, uh, in New York? In New York, right. Mm -hmm. And then... Who did you work for? Huh? Who did you work for? What unions did you no, work for? No, I cannot tell you that. That's, uh, oh, okay. That's uh, independent union. Okay. I don't forget that. <laughs> so, uh, Maria Cordoni called me. And she asked me if I want to help with her in something with the retired that she had nobody in New York. And I went because I love Maria. I love Maria as a person, as a woman, but I'm not in love with Maria. I just want Everybody to make sure. loves Maria. That's, uh, I got it. <laughs> no, a lot of people, a lot of people that hate her. I love like, Maria. A <laughs> lot of people love me, a lot of people hate me. <coughs> so I came to Maria and I began to work with her. And I like it. What no pressure. Even so, this, you know, Maria never allowed the politics. Mm. Charlie did. He said no, but Charlie did. And Charlie was doing things. I thought that the new guy don't do it that way. 
And I told Charlie, Charlie knows, you know, what I'm saying to you, Charlie knows how I Right, yeah. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and I always said that I was trying to get out and Maria brought me back in. That's from the Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been doing, and I've been organizing. Besides that, uh, I was giving, talking to people, getting the car signs and giving it to, to the digital locals and all this. So not just retirees? After retired. After I retired. No, organ, no people. You know, I, I organized a, a maintenance people for a couple of buildings in Manhattan. I like 200 people out of that. You see. That was something that if I was, if I was, if I wanted, oh, that's another thing. I get people retired from the machine union that call me because they want us, they want me to start an independent union. You know, which is, you know, it's a lot of money in that, but this is home. I'm married to one woman, I'm married to one union, for better or for worse. <laughs> But that's it. Other than that, I will be here to take whatever. So you're still organizing? Yeah, lately it's been nothing because I was sick. Ah. And my wife was very sick two years ago. But she's okay now. So are you getting tired? Do you want to take a break? What else do you want to ask me? Uh, I want to ask you about Ohio. Ah. That you was tell it. me a few stories about oh, that. that. But if you want to get a drink of water first, that's okay. No, really. Okay. Not really. So, um, so tell me how you got I involved. was involved in the two campaigns in Ohio, the first one and, and the second one. Uh, so in 2008? Yeah, and 12. And how, tell me how you first got... First of all, I'm a Hillary guy. I was totally with Hillary. Uh, all I the way to the very uh, To the very end. end. When right. Hillary was not there no more, uh, then I, I went with Obama, and when the machine union was, they were flipping, flapping, and finally they ended up around Obama. Uh, I was campaigning for, for for Hillary all the time. She's such a smart woman. And uh, when you see her operating in most groups, like 60, 70 groups, 70 people, uh -huh. like she is, she's an encyclopedia. Huh. A yeah, very, very, very smart woman. Let me show you how smart she is. One time my son was guarding her. Uh, and he was with the daughter. Chelsea. Chelsea. And finally, one of the cops said, can I, can we take a picture for you? And she said, yeah, okay. So my son said, you know, my father and my mother know you. And he said to my son, uh, oh yeah? What's their names? And my son says, San Amcilia Rodriguez. Hillary said, of course I know them. She may recognize us by face, by talking, by all this, you know, because we saw her many, many times. Uh -huh. I never went to her house for tea. <laughs> and she never came to my house for coffee. But of course I know them. Yes. She made my son look like a million dollars. The instant. Or his fellow cops. Oh, look at that. She has the oh. political instinct. Right. She is a fantastic. This is the thing that regular people don't do. But people say, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course I know them. <laughs> That's great. <coughs> Yeah. And then finally Obama gets the nomination. Right. The machinists finally decide to support him. And uh, how did you get to... I went and I was working, excuse me for forgetting names, oh my God, a great group in a small town that was 
an iron town for the steel workers between uh, between Cleveland and Toledo. What's the name of that place? Yellow. Um, no, it's right by the lake. <coughs> not Youngstown. No. By the lake. Uh, we can. Or whatever. We'll f we'll come up with it. Yeah, and uh, I was surprised when I get there, and I see the group that Obama First of all, with a whole bunch of young people. So this is in Pennsylvania. No, no, no. This is in Ohio. In Ohio, when you first get to Ohio. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, you were surprised at who was there volunteering. Volunteer, the young people, uh -huh. number one, the young people. Yes. Uh, from all over the country. In 2008, it was right. remarkable how many young and people. And not only that, but. Oh. <laughs> well, let's check it out. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a message from Tracy, just to the form to sign at the end. Okay. So, um, the Machine Union is embarrassing when you are the least. That's another battle I have with Bob and Barry. Uh, with, uh, they give you a lose of the retires, at least the retired people, uh -huh. called out the retired. Call people that are dead. Mm. People that, and sometimes you call and somebody say, "Oh, thank you for calling my father." That union never got in touch with my father. He's dead for ten years. And that looks bad. So when I was there, uh, I went to help with Hispanics. I begin to call some Hispanics, and I begin to rely the same thing that happened to me in Texas. That some of the Spanish spoke better English than me. So I told the guy, I said, listen, you know, all these Hispanics, they are bilingual, they don't need me. They can't talk to anybody. Right. I said, well, you don't give me a list of all the people I meet from the unions. And the kid said, oh, okay. And the computer, whoosh, give me something like this. And I begin to go to the list of ones. I said, these guys, 90 years old, they 102, they're dead. Oh no, I called those people and they were alive. Really? Every single one of them. I was not wrong, no one person that was not alive. Huh? And I said, how come these people can do that? And we cannot do that with the machine retired. And so the, wait, the Obama list. The Obama list. Every, even if they were 102, they were still alive. They were still alive. They still knew. And the machinists. The machinists. They were calling families. Calling people that were not yeah. dead, people that were not in touch, people that had moved. And the reason we don't have that is because it's an stupid thing in the Constitution that you have to have your withdrawal card. Your retirement card. The retirement card costs ten dollars. And no no local is going to take the ten dollars. So people retire and they leave. And we lost them forever. Uh. <coughs> so we which have is some a big, which is a big loss. That's stupid. Yeah. And at one time <coughs> I want to need the water because of the thing I have in my Yes, absolutely. <coughs> Uh, no, because here. I'm tired, but because I... I you don't want to cough. Yeah, let me just uh, pause. <coughs> okay, this is... Uh, we're back yeah. after a short so, break for so a glass I, of water. I, I begin to do the, the telephone call and to see a few people. And I was the only guy really from labor. Everybody was from the Obama campaign. And... Uh, I made friends very easily, you know. One of the first things I do is I invite people to, they go for lunch, I 
fighting lunch or whatever, you know. And they were very happy with me. And Charlie came one time and transferred me to south of south of Toledo. And that when I met uh, Diane and uh, the two black ladies. Uh, by the way, they came from United. Uh. That's one of the places I organized. They don't know me, but... And I worked with them. And I worked with one couple, one from a local of the Communication Workers of America. And we did the same thing. And you were using lists from... From, from the Obama people. From the Obama people. But you were all a group of labor. I believe people. that when we went to Toledo, we were probably using a lead that the Obama people give us, mm -hmm. or we were using a lead from the how you call it from the uh, different unions. I don't know. So we mostly, when you're doing this, you're knocking on union doors. In the first campaign, we didn't knock in too many union doors. In oh, 2008. In the in, on twelve, we did. Okay, but in two thousand eight. In two thousand eight, I knocked in doors. What the hell is the name of this town? Lorraine, 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 something like this. Could be. I'm. Yeah. Never been to. Ohio. Used to be an iron so town. Sorry. An okay. iron town that you yeah. can see is dead. You know the. There are so that was a couple of those things where owned by the Japanese huh. and then the Japanese left too. And they have everything. They have the iron, they have the coal, they can continue to do. Mm. But we are importing cheaper steel from India and Korea that by the way we built, mm. you and I, we built the base um, steel mills in Korea with the higher technology for them to send us to buy, it. and we have it right there in Ohio. And the same thing. It with, doesn't make sense. I don't know. It makes sense for capitalism. Yeah, it, it makes sense for some people. So, so that was the second campaign was harder because Obama had a record. Wait, before you start, when you started in 2008, you were working for Hillary, and what made you, who drew, how did you get to Ohio? Do you know what I mean? I know you're an activist, so you, once Obama was the candidate and the machinist had, it, had endorsed him. I drove my car. But you decided that was where you belonged? No, uh, you know, I, I, I do a lot of critics and I do this, but I'm a good soldier. You see, whatever they do, I do it. Okay. So I drove from, I drove my car from New York. And I used to drop to Cleveland every two weeks. So going to. Right. Uh, I drove there and. Uh, so you, d you heard that there was a necessity and you. No, no, no. Charlie assigned me. Charlie assigned you. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Right. So uh, I went to Ohio. And when, and when everybody liked me, and I was happy, he sent me to Toledo. Of course, because you <laughs> got to share the wealth. <laughs> and he said that all the women were crying for me. What not the woman? It was not a guy. I made friends with everybody. You know. And do you think that made a difference? Uh -huh. do you th did you feel at the time that it made a difference in 2008? always make a difference. When you do a work, it always make a difference. Uh, we have a lot of people coming. Uh, we have the, the guy that was the governor of New Mexico. What was his name? He have an Anglo-Saxon name, but he's Mexican. Right. Huh? I know exactly who yeah. you mean. Parkinson? No, it's... I forget his name. He came to that town and I was chatting with him and we were making fun because we were saying, you see, I said, you, you and I, we speak three languages. And he said, 
how come? I know we speak Spanish, but we, we speak Spanish to the nobody understand. You're right, he said. <laughs> we speak Spanish, you know. <laughs> Seems that sometimes if you talk, if it's a person there that don't speak any English or Spanish, they don't understand. Right. And if you and it's an American, they don't understand either because <laughs> <coughs> how think this guy is punished. <coughs> and he was there and was a priest there was. But it was regular uh, house calls and demonstrations and more than demonstrations, what meetings in different union halls in the area. Shameful really. Uh, all buildings and you can see that there was like a poor house. Such a decline. Yeah. yeah. Poor house. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, that's hard. Uh. Yeah. But the second campaign was much more because Obama already had a record. Right. And uh, we were quite, we were, of course, I don't know, we were somewhere south of Cleveland. You were in, right. you were in uh, Ohio again. And in Ohio. And then we went to Toledo. And that's where we really did the, the house calls. And that was a great experience. And they told me I'm going to talk about that today at 4 o'clock. I'm going to be with that group. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was, I'm going to give you a preview of what I'm going to say. That was so great uh, of what people can do when they're together was people from different unions, people from different organizations, gays and lesbians, mm -hmm. uh, John and all, and we were having a party. You know, when we were in South of Cleveland, mm -hmm. that was one guy from the union that he almost screwed everything because he got a lot of people. He was, well, you come here. Somebody had to stop him, I don't know who. But I usually make a lot of fun of people that are dogmatic, you know? The Hitlers and the Mussolinis and the Francos and all these people. Doesn't win. That's the same problem I have with the leadership of the Machine Union. Some vice president, not all. I have great friends that were vice president. You know, Bill Cherry was a good friend of mine. Peter Paul was a good friend of mine. Sarayaku, Os Astro from California, Peterson from California, they were, they were. But some of them you think are too didactic, have been. It's amazing what happened to people when they get power, or a little power. They begin to believe that, and you have the, the whole elements of humankind, you know? Yes. The manipulator and the self starter and the mellow fellow guy and all, all these psychological profiles. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they are sometimes they're terrible. But so, but back to, oh, back to the campaign in 2012. 12. Was one of the best, big issues the safety net? Th that was a, a good. When we get there, I believe that Obama was like 10 points behind. And when we ended, he went Ohio by almost seven points. I personally, with some, with, some of the, with some of the of the ladies, some of my sisters, uh, I, I'm knocking about easily a thousand houses to get the vote. That's amazing. Yeah, and, um, and what stretch of time? How long were you there? Six weeks. Six weeks, a thousand houses. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm dying to run into Senator Brown because I'm going to tell him that we saved his job. <laughs> uh, the Cole Brothers alone would like ten million dollars to defeat to defeat him and other people too. Yeah, yeah. We lost a woman that was a congresswoman that was dynamite, but. Uh, uh, they have restructured the districts, which is something that they are manipulating very well. 
the Tea Party people and all that. Mm -hmm. There's one, one district in Ohio that uh, was very solid democratic and they merged it with a very Republican area and with a lot of Republican area that geographically was almost across the lake in another part. Huh. Those people there have nothing in common with the people here. But by they adding those Republicans there, they, they got it. They got to get out. Yeah. Cherry Mandarin, right? Yeah. What did I forget to ask you? Why you forget to ask me? You didn't ask me that I was a pain in the ass, but I told you that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. The, I try to be happy. I try to transmit people. I love people. I love people. I really do. Uh, that has something I, to do with how you organize yeah, so I, effectively. I love, I love and respect the working class. Sometimes the working class is a pain in the neck too. Remember what Karl Marx says. Karl Marx says that when they asked him what they were going to do with the revolution, what Marx? No, I probably was Lenin. He says, we will wake up the working class at 7 o'clock in the morning and put them to sleep at 7 p.m. at night. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> oh, I used to go. I used to, I used to have an Irish, an Irish friend, typical Irish friend, the baloney type, you know, from Ireland. And he used to say quotations uh, of people and all this. And he used to say, a great Irishman wrote this and that. And finally, he quotes something and he said, That was not an Irishman. Until then I learned it. So now I quote a great Spanish revolutionary, Carlos Marx says, 